It's been quite a while since I've touched a bottle of alcohol. I had a problem when I was younger, but I kicked the habit when I found out I was pregnant. I swore I would never have a drop of the stuff again. But now, it's been three days, and there isn't a hope in sight for my daughter. If you're catching this for the first time, the problem started on Friday. Marcy was drawing on the wall in the back hallway of the three-bedroom house, and then suddenly, she was unable to remove her right hand from the wall. Since that time, we've tried every method known to science. It's left my husband stand and I feeling rather desperate. It got so bad after we called Tim, her uncle, we resorted to drilling from the crawl space under the house. Despite the impossibility of it, I can't deny what I'm witnessing any longer. It does seem like she's being absorbed by the house. That was further confirmed when Tim and Stan tried the drill, and after lowering it through the vent, followed by the extension cord, I told the boys to give it a shot and held Mercy as close as possible as the machinery was activated. For a moment, I thought it was working. She wasn't screaming. She seemed to be distracted by the hum. And then it hit the foundation of the house. Mercy let out a wail so loud I thought it might burst my eardrums. Instantly, I signaled for the two of them to stop. They hadn't even made a dent in the foundation, and it was actually causing her more harm. Once Tim and Stan were back inside, the two of them checked on Marcy first, before deciding to go to the den and try to solve this. Somehow I managed to calm her down long enough for me to join them. Anywhere close to her is hurting her physically, so let's try going further and further out in the house. There's bound to be somewhere that doesn't affect her, so maybe we start from there and work our way towards her, Stan suggested. I could tell he was stressed more than ever. He had called into work these past few days to try to help. His job had even called several times yesterday to ask when he would be returning, and he offered a flimsy excuse. But it's not like that he could just ignore Bills forever. I think you should contact the media. I know you've posted it on the internet, so what's the harm there? Tim suggested. I don't want a bunch of quacks coming in and treating her like some kind of experiment, I said angrily. I didn't want to admit that I almost considered posting a video of Marcy's predicament earlier. I couldn't press the button, though. It didn't seem right. This was my child, not some kind of work of art or freak show. I didn't know what sort of attention that kind of post would attract. I turned back to my phone as the two men talked and reviewed some more of the outlandish theories. And surprisingly, the only sanity I found has been to come online and check the suggestions made. I mean, they didn't seem so bizarre anymore. Many of them were practical, like attempting to cut away at the wall from a further and further distance. And that sounded like what Tim had just said. But we soon found out that just about anywhere in the house, when we did something, it was causing pain to our little girl. Even the simplest thing like flicking the light switch on and off, she said it felt like a shock. Eventually, Stan and Tim agreed that they needed to test to see what else did and did not affect Marcy. So they went to different parts of the house to try other things. Meanwhile, I sat a chair alongside her beanbag, and I prepared her. Uncle Tom and Daddy are going to see if they can help you, but it's going to take a lot of trial and error, sweetie, I told her. She seemed numb now, so tired from pain that she barely registered the words I was saying. I sobbed, and I held her, wishing that this damn house would take me instead of her. Tim started in the bathroom and turned to the sink. Marcy said that it felt like she was swimming and that it was hard to breathe. Stan went to the living room and turned on the TV. Marcy knew what show was playing, even though she was down at the end of the hall and was muted. We decided to limit our use of anything in the house, not knowing what could or could not affect her. Ted made a few calls to some nurses he knew over the local ER. The stuff the EMTs gave her was probably not nearly strong enough. If we're going to do this, she needs to be out cold, he told me. Stan and I were too tired to argue. A few hours later, his friend arrived and examined our little girl like she was some kind of specimen, asking us all kinds of questions we'd already been asked a thousand times. I was already concluding in my mind that this wasn't going to work. There's not much room to work with here, the nurse admitted, as she tried to numb the little portion of skin on Marcy's arm that was still outside the wall, between her arm and the shoulder. But the needles weren't working. Most of that part of her body now seemed impenetrable. Instead, she resorted to setting up an IV on Marcy's left arm and gave her a few general antibiotics and morphine as Tim searched desperately online for what sort of anesthetic could do the trick. 
Even if you do get her sedated, how would you even amputate at this point? You would have to cut from the neck down, I said angrily. You have a better idea? The nurse snapped back. We aren't dealing with anything natural. So, it's not going to be solved by natural means. I think we need to consider calling a priest or something, I admitted. Stan was nearby, pouring some coffee. And he nodded absently. I guess I... It wouldn't hurt at this point, he admitted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's look in the yellow pages under Exorcist, the nurse said, rolling her eyes and crossing her arms. I was about to snap back at her for her attitude when I heard Marcy making some more whimpering sounds. I went to check on her. Stan was right beside me. We now saw that her arm was completely sucked in, along with a portion of her shoulder. She was gripping my hand with her left one hard, and she told us how badly it hurt. I want to let go of me she said. Stan's face hardened, and he stood up before going to grab his coat. What are you doing? I asked. Off to find a priest. There's bound to be someone that'll listen to me, he said. Tim and his friends were finishing up the next round of drugs, and Marcy complained about the needles. Every time they stick me, it makes me hurt more in there, she complained. I touched her cheek softly and kissed her forehead. I know, baby girl, I know. It's gonna hurt before it gets better, I said. But Tim wasn't feeling as sympathetic. He held Marcy still as his friend prepared the next round of general anesthetic. Nothing seemed to be making her sleep, though. And the more she was poked and prodded, the more she complained about the wall squeezing her arm tighter and tighter. It was a wonder that she could feel anything at all. Just uh, get out! You've done more harm than good, I screamed at them. Tim apologized for his friend, and the two of them scurried away. They kept rocking her, trying to make sense of this nightmare. "'You should be glad I even came to help,' the nurse shouted as she left the house. Tim muttered another apology and followed after her. Then, just as I was ready to pass out myself, Stan came home, and he wasn't alone. The man that came with him did not look like a traditional Catholic priest. He was wearing just some khaki pants and a button-down white shirt that wasn't completely ironed. Looked like Stan probably caught him at a bad time, because when he arrived, he didn't seem too happy with being there. As he got closer, his eyes narrowed, and he examined Marcy closely. It was almost infuriating to see yet another person scrutinize our child and treat her like an object. I must admit, I've never seen anything like this, he said. Can you help us or not? Stan said in a cold tone. I could tell that he had likely gotten a few negative responses from his search. I can do my best, the priest said, as he went back outside, and then returned a moment later with a small bag. He laid it down around nine feet for Marcy, and then took out a few simple supplies. He first took out a long bundle of sage leaves and stems that were tied together, and then took out a few bottles of crystal clear water. He instructed us to wait outside the house as he began to gently pour the water around the spot where Marcy was stuck. I hesitated, not wanting to leave my little girl. But I understood the stakes, and promptly let it go to stand in the yard. Stan and I stood there, holding each other for the next twenty minutes or so, waiting for some signal that it was okay to come back inside. And the longer we waited, the more uneasy I felt. Was this man really here to help our daughter? What if, what if he was a molester or something? And now, did we even know if he was really doing anything helpful or not? Suddenly, a shrill noise burst through my thoughts. It was a smoke alarm. Stan ran in to shut it off, and I wasn't far behind him. Open all the windows, he told me hastily, as I ran amid the smoky hallway to grab hold of Marcy. Are you okay? I asked her, touching her face. It was hard for me to really see her expression, but she nodded silently as I went to the other windows to ventilate the house. Once the smoke was starting to clear, I could tell what had happened as the priest had lit the sage on fire and then dropped it on the ground for whatever reason. Jesus Christ, Stan said as he waved the smoke away and tried to find the priest. But he was nowhere in sight. I turned my attention to Marcy to make sure that she was okay. Then I let out a louder scream. I didn't think it was possible, but it was now somehow worse. Part of her face was molded into the wall, up to the edge of her right eye, and her lower chest as well. Baby, are you okay? Did that man do something to you? I screamed as I squeezed her hand. She was sobbing again and looked around frantically. It was clear she was panicking because she couldn't turn her head. 
I don't know what happened, Mommy. He was chanting something and talking funny, and then he began to strike the wall, and I, I felt dizzy when he did that. I was scared. He was a scary man, she admitted. Stan checked the rest of the house, but there was no sign of the priest anywhere. I slumped against the wall, feeling deflated and defeated. There was one thing of significance, though. The one spot where Marcy had said the priest had been striking the wall felt a little different. It felt... warm. Hey there once again, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or, you know, listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Before we say goodnight, I'd like to let you guys know about a couple of books that are available right now if you guys check out Amazon uh, before it becomes too late to get them and they're completely sold out. The Neverglade Mysteries Volume 3 should be available on Amazon very, very soon. If you guys have been keeping up with the Neverglade Mysteries, then you definitely don't want to miss out on this one. This is going to be the brand newest book and the adventures of the inspector cannot be missed. The complete version of My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown is available right now on Amazon as well. Big, thick, hardcover book, and you guys can get all the adventures as well as some insight into the next volume that should be available in that series. And of course, there's two new audiobooks from me. Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 is available on Audible, and you can check out the newest Audible book from Vincent Vinacava, Pastel Colored Dreams and Human Flavored Nightmares. Both of those, very fun to work on, and I hope all of you guys enjoy them. And as always, I want to give a very huge thank you to all of my supporters out there on Patreon. I say this every time, but I truly mean it. You guys are the real MVPs, and without you, I don't think I would be able to continue doing this at the capacity that I do. Especially not as many brand new custom stories as we've been getting just for the channel. So a very special thank you to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Ken Landahaguchi, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk 764, The Banana Mafia 1, Hollow Hero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sazaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faya Lockett, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azreen Fox, Robert White, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys once again so, so much, and if you would like to join this list of people's names that I mispronounce, or the list of people's names that are down there in the description, check out patreon.com slash Pasta. and as always, a very sweet dreams to all of you. Good night, folks.